Good morning, golf fans. It's your boy, GS Luke, here with our round four live stream for this week's Houston Open. I've got a little fishing charter to catch in about 30 minutes, so quite literally, this one is going to be under the gun here in terms of time. But I'm going to go over everything you need to know for today, including a look at the weather, golf course ex expectations, idea of what you know we should see for our scoring average. Then we'll go through the prop averages, the DFS stuff, as we always do in here, here on live stream. So uh, it's early. I got to get some coffee in me. I am still waking up right now. But hopefully you guys are having a swell start to your Sunday, I should say, over here. And hopefully we can end this week strong. We have a why win down there, a question about an outright, which we'll get to. We have Mike, Robbie, Dave, Steven, all of you guys up here early. Um, if, hey, if it weren't for golf, if it weren't for uh, fishing in general, I wouldn't be up right now. But hey, happy Easter to anyone that is out there celebrating. Um, even if you're not pretty solid day off right over here on a Sunday. You got David who took Finau and Ramey for outrights. I like it. We had something about Jaeger of a Tia winning. Yeah, we'll talk about the Tia a little bit. I actually have a few live outrights myself that I've taken. You have Dietrich down there with Mike. Uh, I like the call. Toasty uh, definitely uh, earned a little bit of attention yesterday, huh? With that spat with Tony Finau. What's going on, Blood Robot? What is going on, Kep? Hopefully you guys are having that solid start to today. But we're going to hop right on in. I do not have a ton of time here, and uh, there's a lot to go over. So let's go ahead and hop on in. So in terms of the golf course, it played way easier, right, than what we had for the first two days. Now, that was expected. We knew about the potential tee box being moved up, um, and also the pin locations were very obvious, um, obviously easier, we should say. Um, you had a lot of backstops. You had a lot of front pin locations on the easier holes. And while you still had over, I was actually just about a three bogey average per round, they were making about 3.75 birdies per round, which is why the scoring average went so low. So that wasn't particularly unexpected. Now, maybe as easy of a scoring average as we got, right, might have been a little bit surprising. But uh, anytime we're at moving day, we're at a course with relatively good weather, um, you're going to see that happen almost every single time. So that wasn't a huge surprise. There was no waves, right, because there was uh, threesomes off of both tees. So if you look at it, right, there was technically a 0.2 shot difference. But a lot of that was probably just the pressure, right, of the guys going off last. And then some of the last tee times were also guys that just hardly made the cut. So some of your worst players, right, are, quote, you know, quote, unquote, part of the PM wave, right, on a day like today. Um, but that's not really reality um, when we go ahead and look at it. So scoring conditions were pretty much the same the entire day. And while it looks like the earlier starters might get slightly better conditions early on, it's not going to be the type of advantage we could take advantage of, right? There's only about a two and a half hour split between all of the tee times. And when you have the middle of the pack going off early, right towards the end, the guys that are in like last place are the ones teeing off last, you know, maybe some of your chasers, right? Some of those guys um, that are teeing off on the first half an hour of tee times might get like a 0.2, a 0.3 shot advantage, but that's not enough to make them like all the optimal plays. So if you're going out there and you're only playing the early starters, uh, especially for the showdown side of things, it's probably not going to go that well. You need to be getting placement points on a slate like this when we have like five, six guys that are tied for the lead, including Scotty Scheffler, guys like Batia up there, right? One shot off the lead. Um, I think it's like 10, 15 guys, right? Within two shots. Um, those placement points are going to matter. So I would say for your showdown purposes, you're going to need at least three, maybe even four chalky players for today. But those one or two chasers that you're taking, maybe it is a good idea to take them off as some of the earlier tee times. So um, I think the real key for today, right, the chalk is going to matter. You're going to have to get that right combination up top. But where you win or lose the GPP is undoubtedly going to be with those last two spots. And depending on how much chalk you're taking up there, whether, whether it's like three or four super chalky pieces, you're also going to need to differentiate with those last two spots. So, you know, we'll talk through some of the chalk that I'm playing. We'll talk through our strategy a little bit. But what is by far a lot more interesting for today and really where you know you're going to make this a good day or not are with those low owned pivots right that you're mixing into your lineup so in terms of weather conditions you know this will be a little bit more important when we're talking about props towards the end of this live stream but it looks pretty similar to what we had out there for saturday i would say thursday's weather was pretty spot in line with what we're going to see out here for sunday so the pin locations right will be more difficult uh, maybe they still have one t box moved up 
um, kind of like what you had for moving day. But the wins, the pin locations, and some of the trickier holes are probably going to make it play a little bit more like Thursday than what we saw for yesterday's action. So this point six four un under average is probably by far the best one that we see all week. And out there for Sunday, I'm expecting something a little bit closer to this point four three over par average. So um, I think maybe they shoot even par on a day like today. Um, conditions, right? aren't going to be that nasty when it comes to the weather, but pin locations set up. I think a lot of those par fours that were made about 40, 50 yards shorter for Saturday are probably going to play to their full length out there on Sunday. So it's uh, going to be a little bit more of a test. I think that the weather though is not the main reason for that. Sunday nerves, pin locations, tee boxes have a lot more to do with it than anything. Let me go ahead, bring up our DFS stuff. We'll talk through that strategy real quickly. And uh, I apologize if we're going quickly here, but uh, I do only have like a 30 minute time frame, So we're gonna have to do this as fast as possible. So in terms of our strategy here, you know, Sunday showdown is a lot different than what we have for the first three days. And it gets a lot, it, it gets even more different, I should say, when we go out there and we have all these placement points in a golf course that's pretty tough. You know, if this was, you know, the Century Tournament of Champions, if this was the American Express, where we'll get to sometimes even three under par scoring averages, sometimes I don't care about placement points whatsoever. But when we're at a course that's playing even par, or sometimes even over par, um, like you get with some of the more difficult tracks all year, then placement points mean a whole lot more. And the reason I say that, and maybe you're new to Sunday Showdown, right? And that's totally fine. Let's get you on the same page here, is that your first place finisher, right, is getting a solid amount of points, right, if they end up on top after today. Your second place is getting a solid amount too. It's like seven and a half, eight points there. And uh, your top five, top 10 finishers are getting a solid three, four fantasy points added to their score. Now, that's important. That matters, right? Especially when you're trying to get the absolute nuts lineup, the optimal lineup out there entered into these GPPs, but what people forget about is that a four fantasy point score, right? Three, four, like you're getting for like towards the bottom of the top 10, um, is less than one birdie worth of points. And I've already had a few comments from people in my community, you know, asking about how chalky this slate is going to be, you know, asking about, should you just take six chalky players? And the answer is obviously no. It's uh, the type of slate where you're going to have to have probably three, maybe even four of the top five. But those guys that finish in fifth through 10th, unless they're shooting something like three under par, do not matter. You do not need to have somebody today that shoots even par and ends up finishing in the top 10. That is not going to get there for the large field GPPs. And I feel like every time we get to these Sunday showdown slates, I get some sort of comment from someone saying like, why am I not only taking guys in the top 10? That's why, right? And even par, even a minus one, a minus two today and finishing like in tied for eighth or something like that is almost certainly not going to take down the GBP. Now, could you probably get away with that? Sure, right? It's not going to completely tank your lineup if you're taking that player. But if you think that you're going to win the GBP, get that leverage, move up the boards, because you took, um, I don't know, like a Nick Dunlap and he shoots even par today, then, then you're wildly mistaken, right? Just go back, look at the scoring, look at where your fantasy scoring comes from. Now, if it's an even par day and you have five birdies, then you probably get there, right? But I am much more concerned with the player's ability to go out there and score than I am their placement points. So, you know, guys like Scotty, obviously, you know, I'm not worried about either component. He can score and he's up there at the top. But if all of your player pool are guys like minus seven or better, right? All minus six or better, even minus five or better, right? For your entire player pool, you're not doing this right. So you're going to see a lot of chalky players I talk about, especially up top. I mean, Scotty, guys like Tony Finau, even like Tom Hoagie, right at minus five, is getting some attention. But where you start to see the pivots come in and where we're going to start talking about pivots are guys like a Ryan Fox that is literally like in last place right now at 0.7%. Guys like a Johnny Vegas, who I'm taking a shot on at sub 1% ownership. Now, I'm still playing Dunlap. And in fact, I have an outright on Nick Dunlap. So I'll definitely be rooting for him today. But, you know, I picked him as somebody to single out because he still has to score. He still has to make those four or five birdies to get there. And I think a lot of people, when they're building their lineups, maybe just don't know how the scoring works. Or even if they know how the scoring works, maybe they don't consider what you know matters for the contest you're entering. Because if you're playing cash, they by all means, just play all the chalk you want. Get all those placement points for a cash lineup. That's totally fine. I understand that. But if you're playing even in a single entry GPP or especially right, like the big GPP for today, you cannot be playing that way. So that's going to be my spiel about DFS. We're going to talk through a few players now that I like. Um, we'll go through your questions about specific guys too. So if you have any players you want to deep dive on, um, whether it's shots, gain metrics, just my idea in general, let me know down in the chat. 
But uh, we're going to start to go through some players here. Let's see. Who's the one guy I'm playing in a single entry? Well, it would probably be Scotty. And is it viable to lock him? Absolutely it is. You're taking a calculated gamble, right? He still has to shoot something like minus three in top five to get there for the optimal lineup. Um, it's an aggressive strategy, but if you actually want to get leverage on Scotty, that's pretty much what you have to do, right? He's like 40% owned. You're going to get double the field. You're already at like 80% at that point. So why not hit the lock button, right? If it's the difference between 80 and 100% in your exposure, totally fine with that. What's going on to Peach? 433, so super early for you, Owen. That is, uh, you're beyond dedicated if you're up at this point. And yeah, I I'm going to the fishing charter. So I wanted to do this at like 8.30, maybe 9 a.m. when I would be a lot more awake. Uh, I'm waking up as the stream goes on. If you can't tell when I first got on here, I was groggy, real tired. Uh, we're waking up a little bit. And uh, yeah, you're dedicated as hell. I can't complain. But it's 433 over there. Can't you lock Scotty and Finau and still make good lineups? Probably, right? What is Finau's price? He's like, what, 90, sorry, $10,200? Um, it's going to be pretty tough, right? If you're spending $23,000 between two spots, can you make lineups? Yes, you're going to be forced down there into the 6K range. But at the same time, right, you got to remember, and this is just going back to the fantasy points versus placement points thing, right? Like, I know it feels great to have two of those top five, right? You're spending all that salary on two studs. They still have to score, right? Tony Finau is still going to have to shoot minus three, minus four to make it to the optimal lineup. Scotty Scheffler himself, right? I know we talked about him even being a potential lock, right, for some people out there in their lineups. Well, he still has to shoot something low, right, especially at 13 grand. I mean, he's got to shoot like four or five under par to get there to the optimal. So don't feel like you can just take guys like a Tony or Scotty Scheffler and just move on to the next spot. Like you're guaranteed to get an optimal play right there. Uh, you, you aren't. You aren't guaranteed an optimal play. That's for damn sure. Victor Perez in DFS, I like it. His ball striking has been incredible the entire week. Thoughts on Thigala as a guy who picks up a lot of position points if he goes minus five. I'm not worried about the position points, right? And uh, I'm glad we're getting these questions, guys, because uh, this is important. If Sahith shoots minus five, it doesn't matter where the hell he finishes. Minus five, he's probably making six, seven birdies, right? If he's shooting minus five. And if he shoots minus five with a bogey-free round, that's an optimal position right there, right? Minus five bogey-free will outscore all of those guys who finish in the top 10, right? Unless they go nuclear themselves, right? Because, and I was telling this to one of my subscribers this morning. I was uh, He asked a question about um, the lineup construction and whatnot. The difference between um, finishing in fifth versus finishing in 10th is half a birdie, Right. So somebody like Sahith, if he's making six, seven birdies, is almost certainly going to make that optimal lineup. So, hey, if you think Sahith can shoot a minus five today, then just play him on that alone. And sure, yeah, if he does shoot minus five, he'll probably at least get a placement point or two. Right? He'll probably finish top 15, maybe top 20 if he goes out there and does that. Um, if it gets really hard, if for some reason the course is harder than what we expect, uh, maybe that is a top 10 finish by the end of the day. So, um, yeah, dude, that, I guess that's the point I want to make here, guys, is that if you think somebody has that kind of scoring potential in them, that is much, much, much more important than the placement points you're getting. Um, the guys that I'm concerned with with placement points, I like Scotty. I like a Tony Finau, right? So I know I just got done trashing them a little bit, saying that they have to, you know, score to get there. But yeah, I'm still playing them, but I'm not looking at them as a free square by any means. Tom Hoagie there at minus five. He's another player. If he shoots four or five under par, that's almost a guaranteed top 10 finish probably even a top five finish or something close to it. And Tom Hoagie has to finish top five to make it into the Masters. So if there's one player that you know is going to be motivated to try and go out there and get it, uh, it's Tom Hoagie. But unfortunately, that's also a lot of pressure to play with. Um, so it could go both ways, right? So I could see trying to fade him because of all that pressure, but I could also see playing him because he's motivated for that top five. Akshay Batia, somebody I haven't outright on. So yesterday I was just hanging with family. We were uh Kind of keeping track of the golf. My stepdad, my mom really watched golf. So we were talking about it quite a bit at a concert. And uh, I found Akshay at 10 to 1, which I think his odds got a little bit worse. So maybe not the best value there. But I got Nick Dunlop when he was one shot off the lead at 50 to 1. So I've got a, a live outright on Akshay. So kind of hoping he can pull that through. And then with Nick Dunlop down here, I just, I mean, you heard me rave about the kid yesterday, right? I mean, he's... He was one of our best plays for showdown, right? He's one of those players that I think has top five potential on the official World Golf rankings someday. And uh, at $6,500, I got him at 50 to one to win. I don't hate that either. So like, these are some of the chalky pieces I'm getting to. Uh, who else can we say that about? Um, Alejandro Tosti 
is a player that I'm mixing in with a little bit of chalk. But Tia, Aaron Rye, right, starting at minus seven, are all some of my stands towards the top of the board. Now, there are a few others that I'm mixing in, but there also are a few guys up top that I'm just completely taking out of my player pool. Uh, for me, a few of those fades, uh, I guess I'll just point out Steven Yanger and Taylor Moore are players that I don't think are really good finishers, right? Steven Yeager has been in contention a bunch, almost always falls apart on a Sunday. Taylor Moore has maybe a little bit of a better track record at actually holding on to finishes, but uh, it's not somebody that I'm overly impressed with. Um, Thomas Dietrich, I think it's a decent play. I still think you could play Thomas Dietrich, but he's 25% owned. So unless you're completely sold on him, right, you might want to reconsider playing that. Chad Ramey, right? He's nearly 20% owned himself there at minus seven. So there are certainly guys, right, that I'm not taking that are going to be a little bit chalky today, but there's also a good amount of them that I am playing. So just pick and choose your spots, right? Out of those guys that are like minus six, minus seven or better, you should probably consider crossing off at least half of them from your player pool. And then even though they're real chalky, right, even though they're coming with inflated ownership numbers, you probably want at least half of them out there in your 20 max pool too. So just uh, go through, do whatever you want for your process. And, you know, I have my own process for choosing players. A lot of it comes down to ball striking. A lot of it comes down to Sunday performance, right? Guys that have proven that they can take being in contention. Um, but if your process is you want to take guys that, you know, are going to break through, that you saw with the eye test, that you think you're just playing better than the stats would indicate, then by all means, right? These guys are all pretty decent plays when it's all said and done. And if you're playing in cash or in a single entry type of format, they're probably even better plays. So a few guys I guess I want to point out here. Again, we're trying to do this a little bit quicker um, just because I got to get out of here. But Cam Davis, I think you could take for a little bit of leverage. He's $8,100. He's minus three. Um, so obviously not starting with a ton of placement points, but he's relatively low owned. And Cam Davis is an extremely high birdie percentage player, right? And a very aggressive player that we see out here in the PGA Tour. And starting at minus three, he's not going to have any hesitation going after pins. He is going to be balls to the ball, pedal to the metal the entire time he's on the golf course. And that's what I want, right? If the difference between finishing in fifth and 10th place, right, is half a birdie, I want the guys that make the most birdies, especially when I'm trying to get different with my ownership. So that's the idea with Cam Davis there. Um, fits that mold quite well. We've got a uh, Toasty, who I like his chalk. We mentioned that. Cam Champ, right, minus four, right, starting at 9.6% ownership. Now, it's not like he's a low-owned pivot, right? He's not sub-1%. Like, we're going to talk about here with Orion Fox. But all, all the same things I said about Cam Davis, about him being like a high, you know, birdie percentage player, being somebody that has the firepower, the mindset to go out there and go low, uh, are the things that I love about Cameron Champ. And if he does shoot like minus four, minus five, that's probably a top 15 finish, right? At the worst, probably a top 20 finish on a week like this, uh, which is kind of exactly what we're looking for. If you're looking for mega pivots, uh, Ryan Fox, I loved him heading into this week. It has not been his golf tournament, right? But he's too talented of a player for it not to come through at some point. And, uh, you know, it's Sunday showdown. Literally no one's using him for today. So why not take him and just hope that he, you know, ends the week on a high note? And, you know, there's going to be a lot of guys that bitch quit that are over par, right? It could be a Ryan Fox. He could easily be one of those players. But if they get off to a hot start, let's say they're like minus two through their first, you know, four or five holes, something like that. You know he's going to be trying for those last, um, you know, 14, 15 holes, whatever he has left. It's not like he's going to win the golf tournament. It's not like he's going to get those top level placement points. But something like minus five or even like especially like a minus six score from somebody like this would easily be enough to be optimal. And I think a lot of people forget about that when they're playing Sunday Showdown. Cham Kim at minus two. He's only 4% owned. Uh, another high birdie percentage player. Johnny Vegas, another real aggressive player, kind of like a Cam Davis that we're taking. Uh, another guy that is sub 1%. And that's it for the highlighted plays. So it's uh, not rocket science when you're playing a slate like this. Uh, you're really just trying to find the right mix of guys up top, right? The guys that are actually going to shoot something like three under par and hold their spot. And then one, two, maybe even three pivots towards the middle to bottom end of the board that can go out there and pretty much do the same thing, right? Probably even shoot something better, right, than what you have with your top three guys. Uh, your chalky plays, right, you probably want at least like a minus three round. From somebody like a Cam Davis, a, a Cam Champ, a Ryan Fox, for example, you probably want four, five, even six under par. So that's why I say that's where you're going to win the GPP. You don't have to be as right with your guys up top. But at the same time, right, like, and that might seem like, a, why are you taking all these pivots then if they have a harder time getting there? You're, you can only have so many of those top end guys like actually pay off, right? As chalk. 
Not all of them are going to shoot minus five, minus six. Not all of them are going to be up there in contention by the time we get to the back nine. Now, if that were to happen, that'd be pretty cool, right? We'd have a, a hell of a finish for a golf tournament if we had like seven, eight guys that were all eight under par today. But that's just not going to happen, right? That's that's reality on the PGA Tour. It's hard. The scoring average is going to be like even par. So you're just not going to see that kind of scoring. And on top of that, it's a variance sport, right? These guys that have had ceiling performances the first three days, a lot of them have that negative regression coming to them. So that's what I've got for DFS. We'll go over any specific questions. And if not, talk lineup construction and then props. You looked hard at Riley. So last man in would either be a Riley, Lee, or Schmid. I'm not overly enthralled with any of them. But if I had to choose, I would probably go Riley or Schmid. I'm not sure about that. Could be the high humidity today um, or could it affect the play? It's been humid all week, so probably not. It's uh, Houston's a very humid area. Uh, it has been humid the entire week and has been for like the last month, so probably not. It's, uh, you know, maybe a slight effect, but, you know, it's probably like a 5% difference compared to the first three days. So let's talk through some of the stuff over here in terms of lineup construction. So when you're putting together your lineups, this is a perfect slate to hand build because you want to be mixing in some of that chalk with the lower end stuff. And I think the best place to start is to try and take your low-owned plays, right? If that's where you're going to win or lose the GPP, then why not start with those sort of plays? So I'm going to throw Cam Davis in there, and I'm also going to throw a Johnny Vegas um, into this lineup. So I'm going to force myself right, to get different right off the bat, right? I'm not going to start with my chalk right out here in this lineup, and then now I'm going to go through and take the pieces that I'm expecting to hold on. So you know maybe you take Scotty for this lineup. Uh, just for the sake of lineup construction here, I'm going to start with a Tony Fino. Down here in the 9K range, I'm also going to throw in an Akshay Batia into this kind of lineup. And I want one more chalky guy up here. Now, we could take a Steven Yeager if we wanted to. We could go to a Taylor Moore. Neither, neither of them are my favorite plays. So I'm personally going to throw in an Aaron Rye. And here in this lineup, right, we've got two pivots. We've got three guys that I would say are relatively chalky. And now here for the last spot here, I think you could go one of two ways, right? You could take somebody that's a little bit more um, higher owned, a little bit more chalky, like a Victor Perez. You could take Cameron Champ, who's a little bit slightly lower owned, right, than what we have with Perez. Um, if you wanted to go down here to Chad Ramey, I'd even understand that as well. Um, because we already have two mega pivots, and, you know, if we want to be chalky, we can, right? If we want to be different about it and really go for some differentiation, we can, right? We can go with a 3-3 lineup between chalk and some of your chasers. Um, all of that's up to you. It depends on the contest that you're entering. If you're in a larger field contest, I'd probably go a little bit more um, chasers, right? I'd go like the three, three chasers route. If I'm playing in a cash contest, I'm probably having six guys up top, right? But even if I'm in like a single entry, a smaller field GPP, then maybe you do take somebody like Chad Ring, right? You take more of those top end guys, uh, you play a little bit less aggressive. It is all depending on the sort of contest you're entering. And the reason why I say in single entries, you don't have to be aggressive is you don't need as good of a lineup to take home a single entry, right? When there's only a hundred to maybe a thousand other people you're playing against, you don't need nearly as good of a score to win first place as what you're going to need in the large field GPP. So just, it's all about knowing what, you know, contest that you're building these lineups for and then catering that sort of mindset towards it. If I was playing cash, Scotty Scheffler would be in every single one of my cash lineups. I would almost certainly have Akshay Batia too because of his ball striking stuff so far. Um, two players that were also locks for cash yesterday. Um, it ended up working off uh, quite well, I would say. Victor Perez with his ball striking is another guy I would pretty much lock into this lineup. And uh, if you didn't want to take Akshay, I think you could take Aaron Rye as well. His ball striking, his consistency is also something that I'd be looking at in that cash kind of format. Outside of that, though, that is all I've got for DFS. I'll go over any last second questions if we have them, and then uh, we'll talk props real quickly. Let's see. Long shot outright. Um, I don't know if I'd bet anything right now, man. I, I took stuff yesterday at better numbers. I guess if you want to tell me on Dunlap or Batia, you could go for it, but I'm not totally sure, man. I haven't looked at the board. Love the Cam Davis call today. Yeah, I I would love that low score, wouldn't I? Uh, <laughs> relatively low owned. He's not like 1%, 2%, but... It would work out quite well. All right, let's go through some prop stuff. So I've got about 10 minutes to do this here. So we'll do this as fast as we can. So in terms of the averages from yesterday, um, they kind of matter, but they also kind of don't matter because of the different setup that we're going to get on Sunday. So scoring average was a lot easier yesterday, 0.64 under. Birdie average was nearly 3.75. Bogey average was 2.75. Green average was right about 12 per round. And your fairway average was over 7 per round. So 
Every single number there was better than what we had for the first two days. And you can see down here, it says a lot will depend on the T-Box locations because I think it's going to play a little bit harder. So I have the scoring average maybe at best being like half a shot under. Um, at worst, maybe even being an entire half a stroke over par, depending on the setup today. Your birdie average between three and a quarter and 3.75. Your bogey average between three and three and a half per round is where I have it. Your green average, I've got between 11 and a half to 12. So again, these are all quote unquote harder, right? Than what we had for Saturday, but uh, it's all relative at that point. These uh, these averages are still better than what we had for the first two days, but uh, in comparison to yesterday, it will look a little bit harder. And then your fairway average, I have between 6.75 and 7.25 per round, uh, which shouldn't move all that much, right? Over this round out here. So in terms of props that I'm taking, my favorite two props are actually over here on prize picks. So let me go ahead and refresh this. Uh, go ahead and bring up the green and regulation board because it's an over on Bill Zalatoris and an over on Akshay Batia. Both of these players are elite tier green and regulation guys. Zalatoris in his last full year on tour was a top 10 green and regulation percentage player. And then Akshay Batia was top 35 last year and is top 40 in green and regulation percentage this year. And if I think the average of the field, right, is going to be 11 and a half to 12, an elite tier player like a Will Zalatoris or an Akshay Batia projects well over that mark, right? Not just a little bit over that mark, like almost an entire green higher. So I think that you should have guys like Willie Z, Akshay Batia, like 12 and a half, um, at least 12 greens in regulation. And somebody like Scotty, right, should probably even be up there at like 13 greens. Um, somebody like a Tony Fino, honestly, should probably be at like uh, 12 and a half, maybe even 13 himself. Ugh. One second, boys. Hmm. The throat there was not feeling good. All right, but yeah, those are my favorite two on prize picks. I actually haven't entered anything on underdog yet. So let's enter something together here, shall we? So if we're going to take something on underdog, their board is not priced as well as what we have on prize picks. So they have guys like Wyndham Clark at 69 strokes. They have some of your mid-tier players at like 69 and a half, right? Like an Aaron Rye. And let me see where they have uh, Rye on uh, underdog. So they have Rye at 69 strokes. So what, it's about a 0.5 difference for most players from site to site. So I think if anything on underdog, the reason why I didn't play over here is that you almost have to take fades, right? I mean, because you're just getting better lines over here in prize picks if you want to take anything for like an under on strokes or an over on birdies. So let's see what we can find, right? Ideally, if we're going to fade somebody, we want it to be a player in contention, right? That's going to be dealing with some pressure, right? We want guys that... Uh, or maybe going to be feeling it a little bit out there and that you hope go out there and choke on Sunday. So, you know, D tree would make sense. Toasty. I do like them today. Nick Dunlap. I like today, but these are the kind of guys that you'd be looking at fading, right? The players that maybe aren't used to being in contention, like a David skins. Now he's at 70 and a half. So, you know, the projections really not that great. for going out there and taking a fade, but where's he at over here on prize picks? I know they had a David skins prop up. Yeah. They have him at 71 strokes. Like, even that's a 0.5 discrepancy between the two sites. So um, I guess let's try and find a combination that works here. But we want to find guys that are going to choke. And David Skins, every time he's gone into contention, he's choked. So I feel pretty good about fading him, even if he is at 70 and a half. Uh, I do not expect him to have a very good day. Let's see what we have over here. So we could fade his, like, front nine or his back nine strokes. His front nine strokes, they have at 0.5 under. What did it play yesterday? It played 0.81 under. Day two played half a stroke over. And then day one, it played 0.42 under. Ugh. Because, like, maybe we just, yeah, we probably just fade his full event strokes. Honestly, don't go to, like, one of the nines or the other. But uh, that 34 and a half line right there is probably too low. It should probably be at least 35 strokes. So that's why I was highly considering that one. I guess we could go with whole 16, 17, 18 strokes. So just looking at those pins, 16 is, uh, I would say, a pretty neutral pin location. 17, actually, yeah, we should probably hold off. So here's what I'll say about the whole 16 or 18 stuff. We should hold off on those because there's a chance they move up 17 to make it drivable. Um, I thought they might even do it yesterday, right, based on, you know, the broadcasters saying it all week. Uh, Monday, sorry, not Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, right, they had mentioned like multiple times that 17 was going to be moved up on moving day. And instead of moving up 17, they moved up 13, right? So that was a little bit strange. Maybe they do move, move up 17 this time. Maybe we do see it used as a drivable par four. But yeah, until then, I'd probably stay away from the whole 16 through 18 stuff um, just because we don't know what's going to happen there. So 
I kind of want to fade this whole one through nine stuff. I also kind of feel like it's probably safest to go out there and take his regular strokes. So let's leave that one in there for now. Let's find other guys to fade. So Thomas Dietrich is not really that good in contention either. Well, and his, his bogeys is actually 1.1x towards the over. I'm going to throw that one in. Um, Toasty, yeah, I'm not sure if he's going to hold up, but he doesn't have that multiplier there. So maybe Dun uh, Dietrich is the better option. Dunlap, I have an outright on. So yeah, I don't want to counter sweat that. Let's not do that. But Tia, yeah, another guy I have an outright on. So I probably don't want to counter sweat myself with that. Um, Taylor Moore could be an option. Raise another guy up there towards the top. Uh, not really good at avoiding bogeys. So that might not be the worst play. <laughs> They do have Finau at two and a half. That's not the worst play. And these guys at three, right? I'm expecting the bogey average to be between like three and three and a half per round. That's going to give them a ton of push equity right out there at the three bogey mark. But anytime you're in contention, right, you're playing in the hardest conditions, pretty much one of the last tee times of the day, that's not ideal, right? A lot of things could go wrong in that kind of scenario. They got Rye up there, Hoagie. Ryan Hoagie are better players than guys like Skins, Dietrich, and more. So, you know, if I'm trusting a player to avoid making bogeys, it's probably these kind of guys. Um, Norn's a really good bogey avoider. He's also at that 1.1x mark. Yeah, these are definitely going to be the props we take. So, you know, they have guys like Norn, who's like a top five bogey avoider on the PJ Tour, at the same projection as guys that aren't good at avoiding bogeys, right, in a D-Tree and a Taylor Moore, and we still have that multiplier there. So this is probably going to be the slip that we enter. But let me just go through, take a look at the rest of the board. Um, strokes fades could be a thing, right? Like Sibu Kim, I believe he's at 69 strokes. Yeah, over here on prize picks. So pretty much everything's that 0.5 discrepancy. Hostler, but he's not in contention, right? Could be a potential fade spot. Um, Kitayama's at that same number. Again, another potential fade spot, but he's not in contention. And, you know, a lot of people would look at being in contention as a good thing. But how many times do we see these guys collapse, right? Like it happens way more often than they hold on to their spot. So we're going to go ahead and go with that. So this is going to be the stream slip that we're going with. Uh, apparently, it doesn't believe that I'm in Florida. So let me go ahead and refresh this so I, can go, so I can go ahead and enter it myself. Okay, yeah, you can use my location, underdog. You already know where I am anyways, underdog. So <laughs> let's not act like you don't. So yeah, this would be about a 5.7f, uh, 5.7, 5.8x multiplier out here for these three props. And uh, there's a good chance that a Dietrich or a Moore ends up pushing out there at three. Um, but I'm okay with that, right? I'm okay taking on that risk, um, knowing that we're getting a little bit of an extra payout, right? By going out there and taking these two, and the fact that they're going to be playing with a lot of that mental pressure. So that's what I've got for underdog. I'm definitely going to be entering more before we go out there and start the action for today. But uh, our live stream time here is a little bit short. I've got to go catch that uh, fishing uh, charter uh, really any second here. So let's go over any prop questions and then hop on out of here. Can Sam Ryder make it three weeks in a row going bonkers round four? Why not? Right? Why not? He's a, he's definitely an extremely volatile player. He's one of the harder guys to predict on tour because he is just so hot and cold out there. Why not? Right? He's done it three times in a row. Why not four? Um, have you have Fino at 60 to one nice after round one? There you go. And then tailing Dunlap at 20 to one. Yeah, 20 to one's not bad. I got him at 50 to one. Honestly, he should probably be 15 to one. And in the other thing I'll say about the kid is you can tell he's not scared. Like he, he plays extremely aggressive every single round, whether that's to his detriment or not. Like sometimes he gets himself into trouble, right? We, we've seen a lot of really ugly rounds from Nick Dunlap, but how many times have we seen him make like six, seven birdies in a round? So yeah, 20 to one. That's sweet. I'm going to look at hard rock. So I know we had the question about the outright before. Let me bring up hard rock because if he's at that number, I would recommend taking it. I just didn't realize it was going to be that good. Normally, Hard Rock doesn't do a very good job at offering the round four odds. They're normally pretty scam odds, honestly. But uh, let's see what we're working with. I brought it up here. And yeah, 20 to 1 is a solid ass number. That's for damn sure. Let's see. So Dunlap, where are you at? He's, yeah, he's 17 and a half to 1. So yeah, like I said, Hard Rock does not give you the best live odds. Uh, they, they really take a lot of value out of it. Uh, having, having a 60 or 70 to one Tony Finau ticket would not suck now that he's 16 to one. What do we have for Batia? So Batia's 12 to one. So I got him at 10. So he's actually at a better number now than when I got him, which is uh, kind of ridiculous to think of for the fact that he's only one shot off with the lead. Yeah, guys, if you're, if you're going to bet a chaser, 
take somebody who's won on tour before. So Batia's done it before, right? Nick Dunlap's won on tour before. Um, you can say the same thing about Tony Fino. I don't think it's the worst number out there at 16 to 1. Scotty's probably winning. Let's be honest. He's uh he's probably got like a 50-50 chance to go out there and win. Maybe a little bit worse, right? Than a 50-50 chance. But if he doesn't win, you know, there's there's not horrible numbers out here. Like I know Tom Hoagie's not gonna win this event, but he's 200 to 1. <laughs> We've seen crazier shit happen, right? Scotty came back from like what five, six down at the players. Tom Hoagie would have to do the same thing. He's not quite as Scotty Scheffler, but 200 to 1 odds. Who knows? Yeah. Dunlap, if you can get 20 to 1, maybe even a little bit better than that, is probably a really good look. And then Akshay Bittia, 12 to 1 is not a bad look either. Any birdie or better props I love? Nope. Nothing I've entered. Most importantly, what are we fishing for today? So I think it depends. I, I haven't talked to the captain yet. So I actually, my aunts and uncles are out at the boat right now picking it up. And uh, we have a house on the beach, which is where I am right now. There's no one here right now. Everyone's out of the house, which is why I could do the live stream. It's also why it had to be at 7.30 a.m. But I got to walk over to the other house that we have. It's on the intercoastal. And they're picking me up on the dock at that house. So they're already on the boat. I'm the only one who hasn't been picked up yet. And uh, I'm going to try and make sure we can catch some mahi today. Uh, I'm the only one down here actually from South Florida that fishes all the time. My aunts and uncles are from the north. So they're just down here visiting for the week. So maybe I can convince the captain to take us out for some dolphins, some mahi. I wouldn't mind a wahoo. Wahoo's my favorite fish to catch, favorite fish to eat. Is wahoo it's it's by far the hardest fish to catch though they run about 70 miles an hour i'm um, out there in the water they also dive into the props of your boats so um something i've had happen before with the wahoo uh, is though they're so smart that when you bring them up to the back of the boat they go down to the propeller and cut the line so it'd be it'd be fun to fish for some wahoo but uh they're hard to catch so the the captain might not be so keen on that because he doesn't want to have us not catch anything have us just like get snagged all day um, that's all I've got though. Let me look at the birdie props. So I know somebody asked about them. What do they have to hit that in like prize picks? He's at four, right? Like all these guys, yeah, are up there at like four birdies. They even have some guys on underdog at four birdies that probably shouldn't be at four birdies. Like <laughs> Kurt Kidiyama should not be at four birdies. So, like, honestly, if I was gonna do anything on underdog, anything with birdies are better in general, right? I'm expecting the average to be between 3.25 and 3.75 per round. A lot of that depends on if they move up one of the drivable par fours and make it drivable out here for Sunday. If they don't, it might only be like a three birdie average, right? So like a Kirk Kitayama, I consider for an under, like a Bo Hassa, like these guys that aren't playing well are like just playing like okay to this point, right? Middle of the pack players. I don't know. They, they feel like a spot where you could probably find some value here. So let's see what else we got. I got a lot of guys at four. Dunlop's at three and a half, actually. Same thing with Toasty. Um, I know he's at three and a half on prize picks, too. Same. Uh, Dunlop's probably not even posted for a pretty line over here on prize picks. If you're going to take anything over, it's these sort of players, right? It's, like, it's the guys at three and a half that are actually playing pretty well. But it feels like the best value might actually be to take uh, some unders, right? Because these guys have to get to five birdies to cover. Um, Kurt Kitayama, let's just take a look at how they've actually gotten it done so far. My guess would be that they probably haven't covered it all that often, that line, that, uh, that four line, they probably only went over like once this week, but let's double check on it. Let's not guess. And then truly I got to get out of here. A15 is when I'm getting picked up. So this is, this is going to be the last thing we look at, unfortunately. So if you have any last second questions, now's the time or else we're not going to have time to go over it. So it's Hostler and then Kitayama, right? So Hostler. He made one birdie on the easiest round. He made two birdies round two. And they made a shit ton on the first round. This is when we played him for a prop, by the way. He went absolutely off for us. So that was pretty sweet. So there's Hostler. He went under two of the three rounds. And then it's Kitayama. There you are, Kurt. So he had a good round yesterday. He would have went over yesterday. That's for damn sure. But let's take a look at round two. I also believe he would have went over. Okay. And then round one, he went under because he had a really shitty round. So... We have one that went under two of three, one that went over for two of three. And uh, let me look at how Kurt's getting it done. So Kurt's losing with the putter, gaining a bunch of ball striking. Uh, the Hostler one I definitely feel better about. He actually gained strokes the last two days with the flat stick. 
we'll sit on that one. We're not going to enter that one quite yet. We'll see uh, over there on the Patreon page, right? I'll let you guys know if we end up entering that combination. But uh, if I had to pick one out of those two, this Hosser one probably feels a lot better. It's not because he's just gone under for like the first two or three days. It's also that he hasn't played ball, right? Like even when he's gone out there and shot a respectable score, he had like one, two birdies on the day. So we'll leave you with that. That's what I got for today, guys. Um, As per usual, if you want access to all my projections, check out the Patreon page. On there, I have all my spreadsheets posted. So my player pool, projections, ownership, all that on there for you guys to use. Go ahead, go out there, check it out down below and all the different prop exposure. So I post the averages on there, stat averages for every single round, projections for the next day. Uh, check that out as well as the different slips that I'm entering. So uh, I only have two slips in right now, right? It's the underdog slip from the stream, also that prize picks combination. But by the time we get to lock in two hours, I'll probably have at least four or five more slips in. So that's where a bulk of my exposure comes in rounds. Uh, one through three, we went profitable in two or three rounds. So let's make it three out of four, right? When we can make it three out of four days that are in the green, that's when you go out there and really get that ROI. A two and two week just doesn't get it done, right? It's about break even most times. Uh, let's go out there and really get ourselves into the green. So looking forward to it. Appreciate all of you guys out there and uh, best of luck to all of your exposure today.